we are searching for adaptations of machine learning into software testing stages, software testing life cycles, because we have some challenges, right? F for example, in nowadays, uh, the systems or the products that we are testing are very complex and complicated. They are deployed in uh, internet and they are uh, integrated to some other applications, some other platforms, and we are uh, supposed to test lots of interfaces and uh, integrations. And we have to do this. We have to uh, complete our testing activities very in a very limited time, because time is precious. We don't want to have too long testing durations, testing windows. So we want to reduce the uh, downtimes and the testing windows for our uh, activities. Uh, and uh, sometimes we have a very short time to complete our verification and validation activities. And most of uh, us, most of the time, uh, we are running agile approaches, right? So we are uh, having frequent updates and changes. Sometimes just after completing the test preparation, I just learned that the feature that uh, I'm supposed to test is already updated. So I have to adapt to these kind of changes or frequent updates very quickly. And uh, I have to find some solutions to deal with these kind of uh, change or updates. So sometimes these all challenges looks a little bit scary and we may feel under stress, under pressure. And even we may feel sometimes desperate, but these challenges are the uh, parameters that uh, force us to find some new solutions and some new uh, adaptations, some implementations in our processes. And maybe at this time, can the machine algorithms be a good, good candidate to help uh, us improve our processes? Can we somehow make use of the machine learning algorithms to improve our processes? Let's uh, a little bit uh, concern this issue. And we know the machines are already being developed by human beings. So in some manners, they have some limited capacity. But of course, in some other manners, they have uh, definitely some advantages. For example, machines do not forget. If we put some data in, then it is not deleted or uh, it does not uh, forget by, uh, by, by the machine unless we delete the data or the, the machines do not uh, get tired. For example, as a human being, as a person, at the end of a long working day, maybe I'm already tired and I'm already uh, lost my uh, concentration and motivation. So it is very likely for me to overlook some bugs or vulnerabilities, the weaknesses on the product. But for machines, it is not the case. So somehow we can uh, make use of these advantages. They have a very uh, high capacity of data processing and uh, very high capacity of memory. So somehow we should be able to make use of these advantages. And uh, in some applications and uh, in our daily life, we already see that machine learning algorithms are used in most of the applications. We see that uh, in the apps that we use in our smartphones, in our computers, in lots of uh, the applications that we use in our daily life. And we see that uh, somehow they, are, they started to uh, overperform human beings. For example, uh, this image on the slide represents uh, the game, uh, a match between a robot and a human being, which was the champion of the Go game. Go is a very complex and complicated game. For example, if you compare to chess, there are lots of uh, more uh, alternatives in the game. And it was really tricky to, uh, uh, to overperform the champions of the game. But recently, the uh, champion is uh, beat by the uh, robots, by the machine algorithms, and uh, it represents a huge uh, improvement in the algorithms, in the performance of the algorithm. So uh, we may uh, already see that uh, it can be uh, somehow the algorithms can replace the uh, usage or the uh, human parameter in, in some aspects. So in testing activities, we can also see uh, these kind of replacements. And in all stages, we will investigate uh, what we can do instead of uh, manual effort with the help of machine learning algorithms. So let's quickly uh, have a reminder about the working principles of the machine learning algorithms. Uh, mainly, we have two uh, fundamental stages. In the first one, uh, the training stage, in which the machine learns about the system and the product. And after that, we have the evaluation or prediction uh, stage, in which according to the uh, learnings or according to the observations, the machine 
predicts the uh, upcoming samples or uh, outcomes for the upcoming samples. It predicts the uh, outcomes of the uh, further uh, or consecutive inputs uh, to the system. So first of all, it observes how the system works, how the product is working by observing the inputs and outputs. It's trying to detect some hidden uh, uh, patterns or parameters or some hidden relationship between the inputs and outputs. After figuring out this relationship and this uh, traceability between these two, then uh, it constructs a model. And according to the model, it is uh, whenever uh, a new input is uh, provided to the system, it predicts the uh, according uh, output. And in this way, uh, finally, we can evaluate the performance of the system, if it is predicting the samples in the correct way or not. We, we may have some uh, different uh, evaluation uh, criteria, and we, we may use some different metrics to uh, evaluate if our uh, algorithm is successful or not. But eventually, if we are not somehow, uh, if we are not convinced with the performance of the parameter uh, or uh, parameters or the algorithm, then we can update uh, the dynamics of the algorithm and uh, we may uh, do some modifications accordingly. And depending on our problem, of course, we can apply some different uh, algorithms. For example, if our problem is a uh, supervised learning problem, which means the data we have is already classified or categorized, which means the data is all, uh, has already some labels, then uh, our problem is a supervised learning problem. And we may adapt some uh, different uh, algorithms accordingly. Or otherwise, if our problem is a unsupervised learning problem in which we have data which is not uh, labeled at all or which is not uh, categorized at all. And eventually, if we intend to make some groups or sorts or uh, construct some uh, different clusters, then it's an unsupervised learning problem. I will give some examples at the end of this slide. Uh, to these supervised and unsupervised learning problems. And uh, we can use uh, any algorithm which uh, performs in the best way accordingly. So let's start uh, investigating the applications that we can do in the software testing stages. So this is an ordinary testing uh, software testing lifecycle. Generally, we start with the analysis of the requirements slide. We hand over some requirements or uh, defined features related to the product or the uh, different aspects of the product. And then we are designing some test cases, test scenarios to cover all the requirements. So we are, we are making a traceability between requirements and the test cases, and then define our, uh, or make our step-by-step uh, -step test definitions. And then uh, we have the implementation stage in which either we execute our test cases in manually or uh, with the help of uh, automated scripts or uh, automated code. And finally, if we find some bugs or vulnerabilities, we report them. We create some issues, some tickets, and uh, we maintain uh, these issues and we track them. And uh, eventually we try to uh, ensure the stability and quality of the code, quality of the product. We try to ensure the uh, usability or the maintainability and all the aspects of the quality of the code. So in all stages, one by one, we can apply some different machine learning algorithms and different uh, ML approaches in each of these stages. We will go over uh, one by one each of them in detail. And the important thing here is between each two consecutive uh, stage, there is again an input-output relationship. For example, as I told in the beginning, there is a traceability between the requirements and the test cases. And whenever we develop a test code, then we map it to some defined uh, requirements or step-by-step uh, -step test cases. Each uh, code is representing a piece of a defined test step, for example. So we will investigate this relationship between the input and output pairs. And then we will try to figure out the relationship and the underlying model. And whenever we understand the working principles of the system, and then we will implement our solutions. For example, uh, let's start with uh, the first stage, which is the uh, test uh, definition stage, uh, in which we uh, generate our test cases or test scenarios. So as I told, first of all, what we have to do is to understand uh, the way in which system works. 
I mean, for me also, for uh, as a person, as a human being, when I was first involved into a project, into a system, the first thing that I do before start my testing activities to understand uh, the way in which system works. I mean, first of all, I go over all the documentations. I try to understand the expectancy from the system or the uh, product. And then uh, I uh, start doing some exploratory testing and trying to see uh, how the system is acting against different uh, combinations or different use cases. When I click some buttons on the pages or when I provide some uh, inputs, when I perform some queries, how the system is responding to my queries. First of all, I understand what are the outputs for my inputs from the system. And uh, mostly I have some documents in which the features are described and explained. For example, for the APIs of the system, there are some YAML documentations in which uh, the uh, responses, the response codes, the response me messages are explained. For example, after reading this document, I can understand that if I perform an unauthorized query, for example, to one of the endpoints, one of the uh, API of the product, normally I should get a uh, 403 response code, for example, which is the unauthorized uh, response code. Or if I perform a, a bad formatted uh, data query, then most of uh, most probably I will get a 400 response code. So and I think the... Sebastian's trying to say something, but I don't know. I can't hear him. Sorry to stop your mid-flow. Is Sebastian? Can you? I can't. We can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Uh, no, no, no problem. Maybe he's on the phone or something. It seems to be uh, an independent uh, conversation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, no problem. We can. If you, you are talking to us, just try to join again because we can't hear you. If you drop and join again, probably we'll be able to hear you. Because I see you are not on mute here, so you might be talking to us. And you can type in chat. Uh, sorry, Masood, I think we should continue. And if there are any questions, we can take later after your talk. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see he went mute. But yeah, as we told, we can collect the questions and you can type them and we can go over them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so for the uh, uh, API part, uh, I can uh, discover over the documents what are the expected results and the expected behavior of the system to my uh, queries. And for the UI again, I can discover what the uh, pages uh, should act like. And uh, when I navigate through the pages, what uh, I expect them. And in this way, I can have the expected results. I can assert them. Because otherwise, if, if I don't know how the system works, then I cannot complete my testing activities, right? Because if I don't have the expected results, then even if I have some actual results, I, I cannot know if they are the correct behaviors or not. So let's go over some uh, concrete examples. For the API part, for example, uh, let's consider that we have a uh, API for our uh, library. And this is a sample, uh, sample response, sample entity, in which we have some book entities. We have the books uh, data, and we have uh, separate book entities, uh, se several entities. And in each of them, I already see that there's an ISPN information inside, and the price of the book, and the published uh, year of the, each book. And I also see that they are represented, for example, the ISBN number can be represented with a string value with uh, a number of uh, characters. And the price is represented with a double value, let's say. So I already, observe, uh, I already have some observations and I already learn something about the data. For example, if I perform a get query, normally I should expect a response which includes several book entities including the ISPN number of each book and price and your uh, data and values of each book. And uh, I 
also expect a certain data type for each of them. So what I can do automatically to generate some test cases is maybe I can inject some different data into these fields, right? For example, I can construct a, a sample post query with injecting some uh, different values inside these fields. And uh, to generate some negative scenarios as well, intentionally, I can feel some wrong numbers or wrong values. For example, if a string value is uh, expected for the ISPN number, then I can put some uh, integer values, let's say. Or if a positive value is expected for the price, it should be a positive value, right? So what I can do is maybe to put some negative values inside intentionally to generate some uh, test cases, negative uh, test scenarios. So in this way, by manipulating the data, by constructing automatically, according to our observations, we can generate some uh, test input and uh, uh, generate some different combinations of uh, test steps and test scenarios. And for the API side, it is mostly the visual part because uh, on the UI pages, we see mostly the uh, buttons the, uh, which, on which we can click or uh, there are some text fields on which we can provide our data, test input, and uh, lots of visual uh, representations on the pages. So uh, whenever we see some icons or some uh, buttons images, we can make some conclusions. For example, whenever we see a shopping cart, then we can already understand that this is mostly a shopping site, right? And this shopping cart represents uh, the list of the items that I want to order. And if I add some items to my basket, to my shopping cart, then I expect uh, a, a, an order list to be generated. So I have already some expectations and I have already some expected results. So after uh, fulfilling my steps, after adding some items, then I can go into the shopping cart and check if the items are already there or not. And I can, again, remove them from the cart and see if uh, in the final order page, if they are already there or not anymore. So I can again construct some uh, test scenarios with different combinations, adding items, removing items, or uh, uh, making an order, uh, some related items. So uh, observing the page, we can guess or we can predict what are the expected steps or what are the expected operations uh, on the relevant page. And after we uh, generate our ca test cases, the next thing that we do is generally to implement the test code if we are supposed to automate them. Or maybe uh, we will uh, manually execute it. But the next stage is the implementation stage in which we either uh, automate them, the, uh, develop the test code, or execute uh, the test scenario manually. So starting from the code generation to de uh, developing the test code, sometimes it is uh, very time consuming, right? Because normally we develop the test code and send it for a peer review. It is reviewed by one of the colleagues in the team. And sometimes we are getting some feedback and uh, we have to do some refactorings according to the feedback. And uh, it is really sometimes time consuming and if there are lots of members who, who is uh, developing the code, then it is not easy to uh, make a standardization on the code because lots of different people are developing the code in different ways. So it is not uh, in a standard uh, way. So uh, we, we can uh, say that it is customized according to people who is developing the code. So uh, when if we somehow succeed, to develop the code automatically by the machine learning algorithms, it will improve the standardization in the code and it will reduce the time and manual effort that is required to develop the code. And how, we, how can we do this? How can we succeed to develop the code by the help of ML algorithms? If we somehow able to uh, figure out the relationship between input and uh, expected output, then we can just perform the uh, needed operations. For example, on this slide, we have an input and output uh, pair. And figuring out the relationship between these two is not uh, very trivial for us. But for a machine, it can be solved in seconds or maybe milliseconds. It's that easy for a machine. 
because we can see that each value is multiplied with four and the positive values are filtered out and uh, finally the output uh, array is sorted starting from the biggest value uh, until the uh, smallest value so the needed operations are already figured out they are the multiplication operation filtering sorting and some other operations so after finding these needed operations the uh, needed code to perform these operations is easy just uh, the algorithm will uh, only uh, inject the relevant uh, piece of code to perform these operations. And similarly for the UI, we can generate some code automatically. And this is, uh, I think, a little bit more important because sometimes uh, from the tester's uh, point of view, it is much more tricky. Sometimes UI tests are uh, much more fragile because uh, they can fail or they can be broken due to some uh, locator changes. Because we are uh, trying to find the elements on the page according to their locators, according to their ID, or sometimes uh, CSS path, XPath, whatever we are, uh, whichever locator we are using, sometimes they are being changed by the developers. And if they are updated, if they change, then our test code uh, can be broken. So what if we use uh, some visual uh, detectors instead of the traditional locators, then we don't have to deal with these kind of locators, right? All we have, uh, all we have to do is just to find the element on the page. Then why trying to find the locator? Then why trying to find the expat of the element? Then just visually recognize the element, right? So this code is uh, doing like that, getting all the images on the page and trying to uh, match the image that we are uh, looking for. So this uh, piece of code is uh, taken from an open repository, which is developed by test.ai. So uh, I put this as an example, and there are some, of course, other uh, applications as well and other examples. But uh, since this is an open repository, it can be checked and uh, the code uh, can be applied on any visual representation uh, algorithm. And after the code is developed, then we can execute the test cases and we can collect some data from our executions. For example, what we can measure is uh, for an execution, we can measure the execution duration, right? For example, when I first execute my test scenario, if it takes, let's say 10 seconds, and in the second execution, if it takes 15 seconds, then finally, after a number of execution, I can have an expectancy about the execution duration because I can uh, calculate the average execution duration until that time. And for the next execution, I can already have some predictions. If my uh, average execution duration until that time was 10 seconds, then my expectation will be mostly maybe uh, 10 seconds plus minus two seconds, let's say. But if it is 30 seconds, then I can understand that something is wrong with the execution. So in this way, we can automatically, without any manual effort, we can automatically detect the vulnerabilities in the executions. In a specific execution, if there is an unexpected behavior, or if the limits or the expectance uh, boundaries are violated, then I can immediately detect it and apply my fix because otherwise it is not easy to go over all the executions one by one manually and try to understand if everything was uh, in the expected way or not and after execution our last uh, stage is the maintenance stage in which uh, we mainly do the refactoring and again if we somehow succeed to teach the machines the best practices or the anti-patterns then uh, the refactoring uh, uh, activities can be performed by the machines. For example, if I somehow teach the machine, having some magical numbers in the code is not a best practice. It's an anti-pattern, right? So if I somehow teach the machine this rule or this rule of thumb, then the machine can warn me about the magical numbers in my code. It can go over all the code. It will try to find some magical numbers. And if it finds, if it detects, then it will warn me. You teach me this rule, and now I found out some uh, violation. So please go and uh, modify this. The code refactoring and the code review can be done by the machines 
according to what we teach to them, according to what they learned from the past experiences and past uh, observations. And uh, similarly, sorry to interrupt, but just want to let you know, there's just five minutes remaining and then we'll go to question and answers. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll wrap up in five minutes. So uh, we, we can have some uh, self-healing algorithms as well, in which if the test case is broken, the root cause is detected by the algorithms and it proposes for some solutions. For example, what is the root cause of the uh, failure? If some elements are replaced by some others, then the machines are uh, finding these changes and proposing us to replace the locators or the relevant code with the uh, needed or uh, updated uh, situation. And uh, sometimes we need prioritization, right? For example, if we have limited time and infinite testing is not possible, sometimes we have to decide for a subset to execute. So how can we decide this subset? We can go over the uh, likeliness or uh, some criticality of the uh, test cases. And how we can do that is to check the uh, past observations again. For example, uh, in the past uh, executions, if one test case was very likely to find a bug, to hit a bug, then it is uh, maybe it can be included in the uh, feature uh, executions as well. Because it will most probably find another one because maybe it is testing some uh, critical functions in the system or in the product. That's why it is mostly hitting a bug or a vulnerability or a, a weakness in the product. So in this way, we can observe the past uh, data. And in this way, uh, there are some learnings uh, from the observations and we can utilize these kind of learnings and observations uh, for our uh, future prediction, uh, predictions. In this way, we can predict which test case will find a bug in the future as well. Uh, which one will have the highest probability to find the bug, uh, let's say. And now uh, I will share you a case study in which I uh, implemented some machine learning algorithms in our real project. This is related to uh, managing the bugs. And in this uh, study, uh, I have uh, six different severity levels for the bugs, starting from the highest severity, uh, severity class one until six. But uh, actually we have uh, four of them as the real bugs. The other class five and six were regarded as not bugs, but uh, change requests. So normally I have uh, four uh, bug uh, severity levels and one of them was uh, never said because it was related to human life issues. So normally in the uh, real life scenario, we have class two, three, and four uh, levels uh, for our bugs. And what I'm trying to do is to, uh, by observing the bugs, which were already created for the upcoming bugs, try to predict uh, the uh, several levels. So try to make a triage on the bugs. So let's say how uh, it works. Uh, this is the distribution of the data on the bugs. Most of them uh, were in class two. Most of them were uh, high uh, severity classes and the others were uh, class three and four. With this distribution, when I try to predict the upcoming bugs, the algorithm worked uh, with a 73% uh, accuracy. And what the problem was with this combination was, uh, th there was a bias on class two because most of the bugs were uh, opened with class two severity labels. So what I tried to do next is to combine three and four together. And in this way, it is much more balanced distribution. We avoided the bias now. And now the with this distribution, the accuracy is 82%. And still we can discuss about uh, the performance because it is not very easy to judge the uh, success of the uh, algorithm. Because how we evaluate this is, if the bug is severity two or three, is again a human evaluation, right? So it can be, again, uh, maybe wrong. And there are some uh, different improvement points as well, but uh, eventually, uh, we may somehow uh, include this into our processes because uh, in this way, if we uh, get the feedback from the machines, 
then we can much more standardize uh, our processes. And uh, in addition to the classification, of course, we can make some clustering on the bugs to understand which are which bugs are uh, heaping together on some specific features. And in this way, if uh, some of the bugs are uh, collected together on some features, we can go over the feature and try to understand what's wrong on that uh, specific feature. So uh, let's summarize what we discussed uh, throughout the whole uh, session. We went over different uh, testing stages in the whole life cycle. And in each of them, we investigated what we can do with the help of machine learning algorithms. For example, uh, there are some alternative ways to automatically generate the code or automatically generate the test cases or throughout the executions, we can collect some different data and different metrics. And by observing these metrics, we can uh, collect some uh, expected results and predict the uh, upcoming samples uh, accordingly. And finally, in the maintenance stage, we can uh, somehow improve our uh, bug management uh, processes or some prioritization processes. And uh, we can somehow apply machine learning algorithms in our test, uh, testing activities as well. And this will improve uh, our uh, stability and standardization.